um, heat waves. And uh, some of you are probably in much cooler and nicer places. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we, we are fired up and ready for a good show. So as I hope most of you know, um, we always go to Cannes when there is a Cannes festival. Um, there was no Cannes festival, of course, for the last two years. Um, there was a kind of online set of videos, which wasn't really anything like the same thing. But um, this year, Cannes was back. We uh, went to the south of France. Um, we got uh, walked up and down the beach. We got uh, glasses of rosé. Um, and most of all, we just enjoyed meeting people um, from the whole creative industry that we hadn't seen for the last two or three years. And I have to say it was a great atmosphere and um, probably the most enjoyable can that uh, I've been to in the last 10 years. Um, so, you know, big thanks to everybody who um, put that on, um, went there, prepared presentations, prepared parties, um, and just went out and talked to people. It was, it was a great experience. But the thing about can always is it's a it's a full on thing and you know people are issuing press releases and statements and new ideas all of the time and I from the very first time I went there found it really difficult to kind of get a perspective on what were really the underlying trends that were important. Um, as opposed to the kind of the big news story of the last five minutes. So I started writing a Cannes review, um, and I really wrote it for myself and a few friends to begin with and showed it to people. And they thought, oh, that's really helpful. That'd be nice. Why don't you do it again? So I did, and we have done it um, every year for the last uh, few years. And we take a long, serious look back a couple of weeks after Cannes, when we go back across the work that won, back across the trends that were there and try and pull something together. And um, I hope that many of you have uh, seen the Cannes review that I, I write. Um, if you haven't, uh, please do get in touch and we'll be more than happy to send you, send you a, a copy of it. Um, but what I write is kind of a, a business perspective on Cannes. You know, so we look at the industry issues. You know, we look at the geopol geopolitical issues. You know, are we doing business with Russia? Are we helping the people in Ukraine? Does it, you know, how much does that matter? Um, we look at the role of indies in independence in the festival against uh, holding companies. We look at developments in technology. We look at different agency models. We look at how agencies are performing on the big issues of the day, you know, notably this year, you know, diversity, equality and inclusion. Um, we look at the changing role of chief marketing officers and how marketeers relate to procurement. But essentially it's business, but can ultimately is really a creative festival. So I'm not going to spend the next uh, 55 minutes talking about the can review. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Patrick, Patrick Collister, um, who is a creative director. Uh, first and foremost, um, Patrick was International Creative Director at Ogilvy for many years and won many, many Cannes Lions himself. Um, he's been Creative Director of different sorts of companies as well, um, was Creative Director for RAP, fun fundamentally a CRM, Direct Marketing Agency, uh, one of the best for Omnicom. Um, he was then Creative Lead at the Google Zoo. Um, so he's sort of seen a lot of different perspectives on how creativity within our broad industry is produced today. Um, and he's also one of the best thinkers about the trends that underlie what's winning at Cannes and why it's winning at Cannes. Um, and that's what he's going to talk about today from a creative director's perspective, you know, from a judge, from a producer, from an award winner. Um, and maybe if we're lucky at the end or somewhere along the line, he might even add in a few thoughts on if you are somebody who wants to win a lion at Cannes, um, what might be some of the things that go through your head when you're thinking what work to enter um, and what kind of work to produce. Um, that's our subject matter for today. Um, as Steph said, we're going to talk for just under an hour, so we'll be through by the top of the hour. So. Um, do stay till the end of that if you can. We won't keep you for an extra couple of hours, although we could certainly talk for a lot longer. Um, but as my father used to say, 
uh, try and leave people wishing you'd stayed a little longer rather than that you'd gone a little sooner. Um, so with no more ado, Patrick Holster, um, over to you. Right, here we go. Um, can you hear me and can you see um, my launch like marvellous? Yes. Um, Okay, the first thing to say is that um, I did a quick run through with Julian uh, a couple of days ago. And as a rule of thumb, Julian told me that you should allow one minute for each slide, which means my presentation should be 60 slides long. It isn't. It's 90 slides. So we're definitely going to run into trouble. So um, you can get this presentation. Uh, from the lovely Stephanie, but only if you are, write her a very, very nice email. I have told her not to share this presentation with anyone who is rude, abrupt, or who she just doesn't like. But um, if you would like the presentation, then at the very end, the last slides are of the 10 most awarded pieces of work at the festival. So I'm not going to take you through those because I should imagine that many of you have seen it already or seen the work already. What you probably won't have seen is that particular ordering of them. So, of course, you can enter CAN multiple times. And so the more entries uh, a piece of work accrues, then the higher uh, its chances are of becoming the most awarded piece of work of the festival. So all of that is yours if you want it. So um, warning. I love can. Can I think is just absolutely fabulous, um, but it is haute couture. If you look at the drum, uh, creative works. If you look at what a uh, campaign is uh, putting up at the moment of new campaigns out there, basically it's uh, television advertising, social uh, advertising, and not really at all any of the stuff you're going to see at can. But like haute couture. Some of the ideas we see at Can Lions do filter down through to the high street a couple of years later. So with that warning in mind, some stats, uh, Can is down. Uh, I mean, if you look at 2017, which was their, just their most spectacular year with uh, over 41,000 entries, then um, this year uh, they were very down on that. However, can being can, don't worry about the poor little darlings. They're not economically on the rocks just yet uh, because they've managed to put up the prices of all of their entries. I'd love to do a specific um, uh, presentation about Ukraine, actually. It was really interesting that can did make, uh, make it uh, free to any Ukrainian agency to enter their work. And, some of the work was, is kind of absolutely fascinating. One campaign did win a Grand Prix. Um, so uh, we'll talk about jurors a bit uh, later on. And I don't know how many of you out there have heard of this book, The Hitmakers, or have read it. Uh, it's absolutely, it's a fascinating read. Because basically uh, what Derek Thompson shows us is that through the course of history, and especially more recently, what we tend to buy in terms of books, in terms of music, in terms of theatre, in terms of all of these things, uh, is the familiar. We like things we know already. I mean, there was a book written 25 years ago. Uh, I'm sure some of you will remember, Julian, you'll remember the shock of the new. Often, something, a new idea is just uh, too appalling. And so I, I think that's absolutely true this year at Cannes, where, for example, the titanium, in other words, probably the number one piece of work, uh, the top award of the entire show went to Engine uh, with the Kean Price um, Foundation. Uh, I'm only going to share a tiny bit of the video. 15 years after teenager Kyan Prince was stabbed and killed outside his school in London, his potential is finally being recognised as a professional footballer, the footballer he should have been. Oh, my word! What a goal by Kyan Prince! Goal! Listen, man, EA, this is badass. He will be included in FIFA 21 as part of the kickoff and career mode game modes. So there you go. What happens is that... Uh, 10 years after his death from a knife crime in London, he reappears playing for Crystal Palace where he was an apprentice when he was killed at 15, but now in FIFA 2021. 
So uh, a recreation of him that became a huge story and it led to lots of donations around the world. And that's the number one, um, I suppose, Titanium Grand Prix, the most prized prize of all. But of course, last year, what we saw and the year before was Burger King um, hacking uh, FIFA 2021 by sponsoring uh, for the lordly sum of £50,000 Stevenage Football Club. And that then gave them um, the opportunity to uh, uh, come up with the shirts that Stevenage wear, which then got adopted into the game. So, so we see computer games and gaming as a creative platform for advertisers. At the same time, we also see uh, computer games and gaming becoming, if you like, areas in which charities are able to uh, express themselves and get this vast audience, you know, because it's estimated that up to 2 billion people are now regular gamers, but to get this vast audience uh, uh, thinking about brands in the context of gamification. So uh, this was a game um, normally called Devil's Souls, and a couple of influencers played this together. But instead of killing each other in, uh, in order to support organ donation in Germany, what happened is that they were able to give each other life. So this was followed uh, by several million people on Twitch following the influencers. And there's actually about six or seven examples I could give you last year of charities doing the same. So. Uh, the Canadian uh, uh, Royal British Legion, uh, Canadian Royal Legion, uh, setting up um, in Fortnite um, uh, a Canadian uh, military cemetery in France, setting up the D-Day landings, setting up a whole load of World War II engagements in which the Canadians distinguished themselves, all in a computer game. And of course, three years ago, Wendy's invaded fortnight in order to be able to destroy fridges so what we see you know here is is people becoming familiar with gaming and gamification of all sorts well hey hey, hey. so we have so similarly uh last year what we saw was this kind of really interesting campaign um from verizon and what they did was to rebuild the met the metropolitan museum uh, so that you could visit it and go through it as an entirely mobile experience using your mobile phone. So, um, sorry about the dogs. Um, I've got a delivery happening here, but there we go. So what it was, was a completely immersive experience. You were able to go and experience uh, artwork that no one had ever seen before. So then what happens uh, this year is pretty much the same idea. This is a really good idea. But this year it gets made great, where exactly the same technology, the same idea of a museum, but now being revealed the artworks with a completely different filter. The British Museum is a public institution dedicated to human history, art and culture. Come discover over 80,000 works from around the world here in London. You are now viewing the Gregal Shield, Captain James Cook was a British event. We're now looking at the Weagle Shield, which was taken from my people. Collections in the British museums are premised on a simple idea. I'm proud of what my grandfather stole from yours. The Rosetta Stone was not a discovery, neither of the French, neither of the British. It was already discovered and reused in Egypt. Ouch. Speaking as somebody uh, who was born in a former colony, um, uh, I'm not entirely proud of a lot of our country's history, but here from India came this wonderful idea of the unfiltered history tour. So a mobile experience in which the artworks inside the gallery reveal their uh, hidden stories. So as I say, what happened this year, I think it can, there's a whole load of gold awards and Grand Prix were won by pieces of work that were familiar to us already. And I have to say, again, if you look through all of the Grand Prix, there isn't anything incredibly surprising. And I think for the second, third year running, there isn't a piece of work there that I would call absolutely amazing or game changing. What we have seen, of course, is an awful lot of stuff 
uh, that's about good, if you like, brand purpose is uh, a major topic of discussion at the moment in the trade press. And you certainly saw that reflected in the winners. So these are the 10 most awarded ideas, which are at the end of my presentation. Vice, the unfiltered history tour, as I just uh, showed you, uh, scores 54 points. Um, and um, that's because it won multiple awards, multiple golds. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons, and the, the interesting thing is that there in red, we have Apple Escape from the Office, which is the only piece of creative work there that uh, seems to have some kind of commercial intent to it. All of the other campaigns that have behavioral change or want us to feel very sorry about something. Um, and the interesting thing about Apple, because I'm going to talk about that in the context of brand building later, is that is a pretty good old fashioned piece of uh, television advertising. It happens to be a lot longer than the traditional 60 second TV commercial. Nevertheless, it is still uh, a fascinating piece of, if you like, old fashioned brand building. But being that, being video, they could only enter it into a limited number of categories. So, I mean, one of the things that you need to do, by the way, if you want to win loads and loads of awards, is make sure that actually as a piece of brand activation, you can enter it across any one of the 28, no, actually 32 categories that are available to you. So I was talking about good. Well, of course, can itself made it evident that what it wanted uh, was uh, brands uh, with purpose uh, to enter their work there. And ahead of the show this year, these were their priorities. So it pays to be green. We're talking about inclusivity here. Uh, we're talking about uh, creative effectiveness, but essentially we're talking about sustainability. And in fact, CAN itself has uh, no fewer than two categories devoted entirely to goodness, if you like. I mean, I know I shouldn't feel, I shouldn't be too cynical, but on the left is the Sustainable Development Goals Lion, uh, which is relatively new. And uh, can, can Lions are very proud of the fact that that uh, trophy there is made from reconstituted fishing nets. So if you win one of those, good for you, you're recycling plastic. But this essentially is what CAN looks like this year. And so I've color coded it. Basically, blue is, is kind of a flexible, it's just purpose of one sort or another. It's doing good uh, by your customers, uh, by consumers in general. Red is about gender and inclusivity. And green, of course, is the environment. Now, one of the things about being a juror, and plenty of you uh, will have been jurors, of course, is that when you sit in a darkened room looking at advertising, you're extremely conscious of the fact that everybody hates us. And so this is a, an Ipsos Mori poll. They updated it uh, less than a year ago. And you can see that here in the UK, advertising executives are still the least trusted people in the UK, you know, even below our politicians. This is Boris Johnson, who lied on a battle bus in order to get himself into Parliament that uh, 350 million pounds a year would be saved by Brexit. Everybody hates us. And so, of course, when you go into a darkened room, what you want to do is to vote for work that makes you feel good about the industry and about ourselves. And so I think in many ways, CAN actually looks at uh, creative work through this hyper filter. And that is kind of quite ironic, especially this year, you know, because uh, Greenpeace invaded the WPP beach uh, and they invaded the WPP beach in um, uh, all dressed up as dogs. I mean, I don't think it was as hot as uh, it is today here in the UK, but they must have been sweltering in there. I can't quite work out what the association between this is fine, uh, the dog meme, and um, I think it's irony. That meme, dogs, this is fine, it means this is not fine. So they invade, anyway, they invaded the WPP beach at exactly the same moment that the WPP agency was winning an award inside the Palais for Greenpeace. And so, um, so for me, that's kind of, kind of quite interesting that Greenpeace is an organization uh, of activists. And the organization itself actually is not really about marketing driven solutions uh, to their problems. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment, because I think that's one of the key 
things that I noticed coming out of Cannes. And I'm going to talk about the fact that personally, I think that um, sustainability is too important for marketing. It, it should be about real business change. Um, and certainly Greenpeace seems to feel the same. And in terms of business change, honestly, we've got some real problems as an industry to deal with, you know, both practical as well as moral. So this is uh, the Ad Net Zero team. Uh, and all of these 17 people flew into Cannes uh, in order to talk about uh, how as an industry we're going to move towards Ad Net Zero in by 2030. And so, I mean, my conservative estimate is that in order to talk about Ad Net Zero, they would have got through around 10 tonnes of CO2. And of course, it is an uncomfortable truth that what we do in our industry is support consumerism. So, of course, the more people are buying, then the more their purchases are going to be willy nilly contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. And one particular group of uh, econometricians have worked out that the IPA Effectiveness Grand Prix from 2019, this Audi clowns campaign, you know, has probably led to an increase of over 5 million tonnes of CO2 into the atmosphere. And so, as an industry, we really do actually have to take on board some of this. Again, I've got lots of theories about how we might do it, and there are organisations out there struggling with it. But at Cannes, it seemed to me that it was an uncomfortable truth that people preferred to simply avoid rather than discuss. However, if you do look at the winners, and Julian really hates this logo. He thought it was very militaristic. But actually, it's, but it's about brewers and how brewers uh, have been embracing sustainability and business change. So I thought I'd just run you through what I think are the good, the bad and the ugly of beer brands in particular, who are espousing, if you like, um, green causes uh, and purpose. So the first is, and by the way, if you want to win an award at Cannes, it's great. You get a second bite at the cherry uh, the following year because you then can enter the Creative Effectiveness Award and you just submit, you know, the, the, uh, the results. And so um, this won a Grand Prix last year and it won a Grand Prix again this year. So essentially, this was InBev, Michelob in America, um, committing to pay farmers uh, for the next three years a, um, an improved price on their barley and wheat, which they could then uh, uh, sell uh, in order for them then to be able to uh, uh, move to become organic farmers. So in three years time, it's a contract, a guaranteed contract that Michelob will buy all of their organic wheat in order to go into their beers. So it's costing them a lot of money now, but in three years' time, it's probably a brilliant, brilliant piece of brand building. So that is a business-changing idea, and, um, and I think it's very good. I, I also think that the lion probably deserves to sit in the client's reception rather than the agency's, because this will cost them quite a lot of money in the short term. But also good, and I really like this, was Corona Beer. Uh, this won three golds in sustainable development, brand activation and outdoor. And the simple idea here was that they, um, Corona Beer, which is brewed in Mexico, invited 30 fishermen to a fishing tournament in the Gulf of Mexico, but they were asked to fish for plastic. Now, the interesting thing about this is that uh, all of the boats, when they brought the plastic ashore, uh, Corona had fit, fit fixed up with a recycling plant to purchase that plastic. And in fact, it's commensurate with fish. So as the fishing industry shrinks in the Gulf of Mexico, so now Corona is supporting fishermen in the recycling endeavor. The other thing I really like about Corona is, as an organization is that actually they are already uh, net zero plastic uh, users. And, um, and they've uh, also invited in um, sustainability organizations to give them clean bill of health. So there is nothing woke about them at all. This is genuine and their business reflects all of this. And even though this one absolutely bugger all, I think it's part and parcel of Corona, as I say, as a beer brand, walking the walk as well as talking the talk. 
So here they are, their packaging is now made out of uh, reconstituted barley. So again, it's this circular green economy. Um, meanwhile, here's a really fascinating uh, campaign in uh, business transformation. And business transformation for me is probably the most interesting category it can, especially if you're talking about brand purpose. And so this one, a silver, why this is interesting to me isn't so much that it won the silver, but this was entered by Budweiser themselves, not by an agency. In 2017, we made a pledge. So starting today, Budweiser he is going green. As it plans 100% renewable electricity generated from <laughs> wind power. In 2022, we stepped it up a gear. We saw that 90% of the hospitality industry was still running on non-renewables. But for most venues, switching to renewable energy is proving too expensive. So, as one of the world's largest purchasers of green energy, Budweiser took a bold step. For the first time in our 146-year history, the world's biggest beer began supplying renewable electricity. We set up the Budweiser Energy Collective it has one goal, help every bar, venue, and stadium in the world that serves Bud. So there's Budweiser using its clout in order to be able to bring small energy suppliers together and then giving them a, a ready-made market. So, I mean, really fascinating. And in uh, Brazil, Heineken have been doing pretty much the same thing, trying to get more green energy into bars and then using that story in order to be able to persuade drinkers that it's in everybody's interest, the country's interest, that they drink in these bars. So again, this is actually about building a business. It's not about tree hugging. So Green Endeavours, where it transforms business, is about business purpose. It is about making profits, you know, and profit and purpose go together side by side. So uh, elsewhere in the world, Heineken doing interesting things in Italy, uh, of course, with COVID, the second uh, series of lockdowns, you know, there was nearly half a million kegs of uh, unwanted beer in closed down uh, Italian bars. And so what Heineken did to support those businesses and prevent them from collapsing was to buy the beer back and then uh, turn it into yeast oriented products, including uh, fuel, biofuel there, which again, I mean, some of you will remember, we like voting for uh, work we're familiar with. Four years ago, Brutroleum for DB export in New Zealand won something like six golds, where they took the yeast that was brewed in DB export and created uh, fuel. And they sold this from a petrol station in the middle of Auckland, calling it Brutroleum. So it's an idea we're familiar with. This time it only gets a couple of silvers. But then there's the bad. I think this is complete bollocks, frankly. And this is Coors in Miami. Uh, and what they did was um, to create a whole series of posters on the top of 18 buildings. So you're looking down now on the top of a, uh, a, a I suppose it's about a 12 story building in Miami housing, and it's kind of low cost housing. And they created a whole series of posters for uh, Coors Light using reflective material. So the sunlight is bounced back off the building, thus making sure that actually uh, air cooling isn't as expensive inside it and reducing everyone's energy bills. You know, but they've only done this across 18 buildings. And how many people are going to look at a bloody poster from the air? Yeah, I mean, on, you know, the whole thing about it really, really annoys me. I don't think too much of this either. I mean, this is an agency called Africa, which is based in Sao Paulo. And last year, we're responsible for the worst piece of scam in the festival. And this year, this feels pretty bloody scammy to me. So the Jatoba is a tree. And what they did is they got this tree to write to 100 embassies in Brazil asking for uh, refugee status. Um, because their theory being that, that as the Amazonian rainforest is being um, destroyed, then trees, as much as anybody uh, on this planet, you know, deserve to be given asylum. And uh, 
This won a gold in outdoor, for heaven's sake, because what they did is that they found ad shells near the 100 embassies and put the letter inside the ad shell. And again, to me, this all just feels incredibly flaky, designed to win an award rather than do anything serious. Um, and so, uh, but then we get to this, and uh, this was from Abbott Mead Vickers and Hope Reef for Sheba Pet Foods. Uh, I'll play a tiny bit of the video. Um. Sheba is committed to bringing coral reefs back to life. That's why we grew the Sheba Hope Reef, a living billboard made of regrown coral, the first piece of outdoor that's visible on Google Earth. Supported by the UN and the WWF, Sheba created a new solution to rebuild a dead reef in Indonesia. Using the Reef Star system to create the perfect environment for coral to thrive, Sheba's marine biologists regrew the coral to form the Hope Reef. A well, uh, I run an award show called The Capels, and this did not win a gold. I mean, at one stage it was up for a gold. Uh, and the reason it didn't is because the Australian jurors, and we had uh, five of them, uh, no, six of them from, all of the Australian jurors were incensed by this because what they were saying is if you look at a problem like the Great Barrier Reef, uh, this particular solution is totally irrelevant. It is tiny. You know, the big deal being that they may well have got Google Maps to uh, show it if you uh, inspect the Indonesian reefs on Google Maps. But this is just an absolutely microscopic solution to a huge pro a problem. In addition to which, I mean, the connection between Sheba and fish and cat food is incredibly tenuous. And so um, anyway, the Capels judges uh, didn't give it any golds, but it got two Grand Prix at Cannes. And again, I have to say, that for me, what is really worrying about this is that it's about uh, purpose-driven marketing. In other words, I think that there is, and I'm not sure that this is true in this particular case, uh, I don't want to be had up for calumny, but quite often I think that companies see marketing as being a smokescreen for their inactivity in terms of sustainable business practices. So I was talking to you a moment ago about Budweiser, and of course I saw this headline in marketing uh, online, AB InBev, creativity can solve people's problems and marketing should be flying the plane. And I'm going, no, I don't think so. Actually, I think what should be flying the plane is the CEO and the main board of a company, not the CMO. And it is really interesting, isn't it? When you look at the overall industry statistics, you'll see that CMOs as a breed are in decline. Uh, chief growth officers are increasing, but CMOs are in decline. So here is a really interesting case history. Uh, and this is, again, I, uh, the most fascinating category of all for me at Can this year uh, was creative business transformation. And so here was a case history called How Creativity Helped AB InBev to Grow. After a decade of mergers and acquisitions, the world's biggest brewer faced a challenge. The tap on deal making had run dry, and AB InBev had to fundamentally reimagine how to grow. Instead of buying brands, the company would now have to grow by building them. So, CreativeX was born, a top to bottom transformation program to put creativity at the center of our business. We powered it with a common language to make creativity flow. Creative brain trusts with outside experts to take ideas further, global awards to celebrate. Them. Then launched a global marketing academy to cultivate new skill, a new culture and capabilities function to champion the change around the globe. And finally, our own in-house agency to bring the new creativity home. A new creative culture to cold, transforming everything from how our products are. Well, it will come as no surprise to you to discover that that won absolutely fuck all. Uh, and one of the reasons it won nothing is because what it's about is culture change. And it's about real business change, which is invisible. I mean, I was talking about this last week. IKEA, uh, for example, made a sofa um, in pre uh, so in pre change days that 100, had 122 parts. As a result of IKEA's board driven sustainability effort, an IKEA sofa is now made with under uh, 25 parts. So the amount of energy that they're saving, the amount of uh, water that they're saving, 
how this then goes back into the whole recycling event. All of this is enormous, but completely invisible. And of course, of no interest to can jurors. On the other hand, I suppose this did win a Grand Prix and this is visible and this is uh, Dole, who uh, began to wonder what they could do with uh, the pineapple leaves. In fact, pineapple leaves are a bit of a problem um, for them. But they managed to team up with a UK based startup called Ananas Anam and turn pineapple leaves into a leather substitute. So here is a, a, a really interesting, not business transformation idea, but actually, if you like, a pineapple transformational idea, new products, and new services. Um, and uh, it won, it won silver. So um, this is Itau Bank. And they came up with a completely new uh, business transforming idea too, which is if any of you've got an app on your phone from Barclay or your bank, what Itai Bank have now managed to do is to move everything into a WhatsApp um, application. So you can do all of your banking through WhatsApp, no separate downloads, no separate anything at all. Uh, and given the fact that WhatsApp is, uh, is growing, uh, that's kind of incredible. This in business transformation got a bronze. I think it's, bit, it's sort of much bigger than that. And this is in India, where you can now... Packaging is the face of a brand. But in India, it's also the face of plastic pollution. Plastic is on the streets, in the oceans, the mountains. Thousand tons of plastic. And the uncomfortable truth is that some of it has got our name on it. And that is not okay with us. With Unilever liquid product packaging reaching 9 out of 10 Indian households, we needed a sustainable business transformation. So we sacrificed the most valuable branding asset, our packaging. Introducing SmartFill, an in-store experience that lets our customers buy Unilever liquid products while reusing other brands' plastic waste. From old packs to soda bottles to even competing. There you go. Uh, smart idea. Use whatever plastic bottles you've got. It might be a rival brand in order to be able to uh, buy your Unilever unguents. Um, so, uh, so interesting stuff there. Uh, that won a gold in uh, what did that go again? in um, design actually. So as an agency, uh, what are you supposed to do? Well, I thought this was a really, really interesting uh, campaign case study. Oh, by the way, going back to case studies, that one I've just shown you. Ah. Honestly, the first 60 seconds of that, I should have edited out. I, I've trimmed most of the award submission videos. Honestly, the first 60 seconds of most uh, award submission videos are complete bollocks these days ah! and when you're a juror sitting in a darkened room it drives you mad the puffery up front just tell me what you did tell me what the idea is what the results were and let me get out of here anyway this was a, an agency in turkey and um uh, i feel really sorry for them because again this won absolutely nothing but actually i think all of their intentions are the intentions of most of us in uh, adland What if the best innovators behind making goods put their minds to doing good? Arçelik is Turkey's number one white goods brand. They are in world's top five, they are known to be environmentally conscious, and they are genuinely concerned about the escalating problems in Turkey. So, they briefed us for an awareness ad campaign. Instead, we came up with an idea that would trigger a thousand ideas. The Goodness Department. A team of 21 formed by Archelix award-winning R&D engineers, NGOs, scientists, activists, academicians, and marketing experts gathered for the sole purpose of using the brand's vast power to do good for the environment. Tasked to brainstorm periodically for unconventional solutions. Nothing was off limits starting from improve i think that's great here's an agency briefed to do a campaign and they go no sustainability is too important 
why don't you create a department uh, with some of your very best brains and they will take a look at every aspect of your business and how that can be made sustainable in order to be able to support the people of the country, uh, your customers. And of course, the long term brand effect of this will be to drive sales and all the rest of it. Anyway, they won absolutely sod all. So there we go, brand purpose. I mean, in many ways, CAN is supporting smokescreen work as opposed to real business transformation. And so um, I, I, I hope that, I think it's a really interesting category and I really hope that next year, you know, whoever the chairman of the jury is and the jurors will be looking at a kind of broader perspective, as I say, rather than just campaign driven. Now, one of the things about CAN uh, last year was that there were three funny ads in the entire entertainment section, actually across the entire uh, panoply of uh, entries. And this year, there are even fewer. I mean, the theory was that coming out of COVID and the economy lightening up, there would be more laughs. Well, there weren't. And this was something that Ryan Reynolds picked up on in his talk. So... He said that actually, in many ways, one of the big curses of uh, creativity and advertising is too much money and too much time. And to an extent, I really, really do sympathize with him. You know, that actually as creative people, if you respond, you know, absolutely on the hoof to the brief in front of you, then you haven't got time to pull your hair out. You just do it. And if it works, it works. It's great. If it doesn't work, then you move on to the next thing. Spending too long, we just actually screw things up so i'll tell you what, i'm just gonna uh, i'm gonna uh, the really fascinating thing is that ryan reynolds you know is probably now one of the most uh, celebrated copywriters in the world you know because he writes his own ads for his own aviation gym but he's now got a little agency actually not so little any longer and he does make funny ads so i thought uh, we ought to have a look at a funny ad one of the things that he's done though on youtube is that he's um, put a single a signal in the video that uh, uh prevents you downloading his work which again I'm, I, I'm not sure why but it's really interesting anyway stephanie if i come out of this will you share everyone will you show the advert sure thing. we need a laugh i feel we need a laugh Can you see this? Yeah. Cool. As the owner of Wrexham Football Club, I need to watch out for our players. I've been a star for a long time. These guys have no idea what's coming. It's cold. Look, we got a big match coming up, and I know what you're worried about. Cybersecurity. How many of you have heard of 1Password? Really? Okay, well, how many of you have downloaded 1Password? Wow, no idea Wales was so cutting edge. So I guess you know that uh, 1Password completely secures your digital life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mullet! I will shove a red card so far up your ass, people will think it's your tongue. Now, let's talk nighttime skincare routines. 1Password, the simplest, smartest, so there we go. There's uh, Ryan Reynolds uh, telling us that we are, uh, oops, hang on. There's Ryan Reynolds telling us that uh, we need to lighten up. We need to have fun. Um, but can you see my screen again? Yes. Interestingly, he didn't enter any of his work because <laughs> I went to go and have a look. So he obviously doesn't think much of awards. Um, but he was very interesting on the subject. Advertising should be fun. He also talked a bit in this context um, uh, about brand building. And of course, it's a big thing with the IPA at the moment. Uh, Peter Field was there, again, talking about the long and the short of it, the fact that uh, marketing seems to be more short-term driven at the moment than long-term brand building. And overall, that's gonna be a real problem for our entire industry. So he was there uh, with Walk talking about that, the triple jeopardy of attention with Orlando Wood, author of uh, Watch Out. 
Um, but what I thought was interesting, and of course, what they all agree is that brand building is about characters in advertising. It's about storytelling and personality, uh, as opposed to quick cuts and supers and ja jarring music. What I found so interesting is that actually there was a brand at Cannes doing and sharing with us brand building advertising of a really traditional sort. And it's Apple. And you would expect Apple to be into all kinds of tech and to be doing the whizzy cutting edge stuff, instead of which all of their entries are actually good old fashioned video. And so some of you will uh, have seen uh, The Office Originally, they were the underdogs. The same team then a year later uh, popped up in uh, work from home and now escaped from the offices that they uh, have started up on their own. And as I say, this came into the top 10 of both the last one, most awarded pieces of work at Cannes, which I think is rather remarkable under the circumstances. But what is also remarkable is how each of these pieces of film is getting longer. And if you, any of you do ever take, uh, look at the YouTube um, uh, top 10 lists of advertising, you'll see that long form dominates. So long form video based advertising really, really works. And so- Can I ask you a question? There you go. Am I out of focus? You're fine. Yeah, but I mean, look at me, I'm all, I'm all blurry. Well, you're supporting cast. What? The camera focuses on the most important character, which is me. Well, what if my character had a big reveal? Like what? Like maybe I'm the killer. Are you? Yeah. You see, all of that, well, it's good old fashioned demo, but there's characterization. And they've done that in advertising. Uh, that didn't win anything. But the, again, what I like about Apple is it's about their products and it uses their products. So these are all uh, shortlisted and winners uh, shot on an iPhone. The Comeback, by the way, if you find the time, uh, is a film made for China. And uh, it's just fabulous, I mean, honestly. Find it on YouTube. But I'm scurrying on because I'm conscious of time. The other thing about Cannes this year was the uh, was the metaverse, and uh, and God, the metaverse is so peculiar at the moment, isn't it? I mean, here's Budweiser. You know, normally Budweiser uh, tried to sell us beer. You know, but now suddenly, as well as trying to save the planet, they're trying to sell us NFT horses. So uh, the horse connection, Budweiser, what are, and they're trying to sell us horses that run in a race called Z Run. And they're trying to sell these at $225 a throw. Um, and so what we're beginning to see now is, uh, and especially across the charity sector, sector brands selling FT, NFTs in order to make money. So the Canadian, uh, uh, the Royal Canadian Legion, for example, sold NFTs of poppies. Uh, and what they're waiting for and hoping for is that these NFTs over time will appreciate in value because the way the NFT market works is that the original creator gets 10% of the sale uh, price of all of that. So here we are, you know, NFTs and, uh, uh, were, and, um, the, and the metaverse were a major topic of conversation in Cannes. But I thought this was kind of absolutely fascinating that uh, there was a, a, young, a young woman uh, wrote an article about uh, the metaverse very recently in campaign saying that actually um, uh, it's a space in which people are simply replicating their uh, corrosive behaviors in the real world. And here we go. Uh, some of the conversations that were happening in the auditorium were about uh, AI and is AI uh, going to take jobs away? And it is fascinating. I mean, um, 
most of last year and the year before, I was a consultant to a company called AdLib. And AdLib basically uses AI technology in order to re-edit and to refresh digital advertising. There isn't a, a human being involved. And so uh, designers um, and um, uh, video monkeys are being replaced. So what's going to happen in our industry? Well, Wonderman Thompson uh, can and even Meta themselves all created metaverses uh, to try and answer some of these questions for us. And I have to say, uh, I've been to two of them. I couldn't get into the um, Meta metaverse, but uh, neither the Can uh, metaverse or the Wonderman Thompson metaverse, uh, which were um, beaches you know, intended to somehow replicate Can were tremendously exciting for me. It was an opportunity for you to just go and look at some of their case histories, apart from anything. Uh, but there were some interesting conversations about it. So here's Gary Vaynerchuk. Now, he is really big into NFTs. Uh, and so he brought along with him, very, very strangely, you might think, Paris Hilton. Uh, and Paris Hilton actually managed to secure more tweet mentions than anybody else who attended Cannes this year because of her followers. And what she was there to do was to talk about Paris World. And Paris World for her is this incredible opportunity for her to join up with retailers and create a shopping experience, which looks a bit like this. This is her metaverse. There. Hey guys, it's Paris Hilton. Welcome to the Neon Carnival in Paris world, the hottest after party in the metaverse. Make sure to put on your best festival outfit. We have exclusive Neon Carnival merch and amazing items brought to you by Levi's. There you go. We have amazing merch brought to you by Levi's. So this is a brand partnership between her uh, and Levi's uh, worth a lot of money to her. And in the metaverse, what you can do is you can try on Levi's gear, um, and there's a good chance that you may actually encounter Paris Hilton herself in, in here because she's walking through it. So it's kind of a virtual real experience, if you see what I mean. And, uh, and boy, is she getting millions of followers. So here you can see that the metaverse to her the means, metaverse. The metaverse. Real estate in the metaverse. Shopping. Pouring hundreds of millions of dollars. Plot. To charities, what it means is that it's uh, an opportunity to be able to talk about issues and to raise money. However, I have to tell you that when you look at uh, the work submitted, uh, almost all of it is taking the piss. So... Um... <laughs> and companies are pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into the vision of the metaverse. Introducing the new virtual Heineken Silver with no calories, no hidden ingredients, and no beer. Mm, okay, try to try it now. The world's first virtual beer. So there you go, uh, Heineken jumping on a bad wagon, taking the piss, and uh, Iceland doing exactly the same. Our company is now Meta. But they're building a metaverse. Are we supposed to just pretend that's not terrifying? In November 2021, Facebook announced their vision for the future, the metaverse, and the internet exploded. Everything can't be freaking virtual. I don't see if someone's strapping a freaking screen to their face all day. Just 10 days after the merciless meme storm began, Iceland, yes, the country, launched the perfect metaverse alternative. Some said it's not possible. Some said it's out of reach. To them, we say, it's already here. Seriously, look, it's right here. And what do we call this not so new chapter in human connectivity? The Iceland worse. So, there we go. so uh, I think I'm gonna wrap up now. Um, so I've talked a bit about the fact that um, uh, technology here, uh, when you see technology, um, espoused in campaigns like this. As I say, it's essentially taking the mickey. But you know, Cannes is two festivals, and it was Martin Sorrell uh, who pointed this out. 
that actually for all of the people who are there to do real business, it's a tech festival. And so those are the big um, uh, tech companies, Google and Facebook, uh, Meta and Amazon, and uh, that whole panoply. And they are talking about first party data. They're talking about th the deprecation of third party data. They're talking about performance advertising. And that is what they're, they're, they're referring to the whole time. Really big business deals, big business package deals. Meanwhile, in the Palais, you know, we're still talking about something else. We're talking about, if you like, marketing campaigns. So we see can as it were two entirely different festivals. You know, Julian went for a walk uh, down Yacht Valley, which is where all the real business is being done. Um, meanwhile, in the Palais itself, we've got the CMOs and we've got campaigns. And these two are getting further and further apart, which takes me back to the very beginning, because that is what Greenpeace spotted. Greenpeace see that the advertising industry itself needs to become more purposeful, not campaigns, but the industry itself. So on that note, any thoughts, any arguments? Uh, thanks so much. We actually have had a question um, in the chat. And if anyone else, uh, we've got a couple of minutes for a couple of questions there. Anyone, please send them to me. Um, but someone, while you were speaking, asked, do you think creators and their clients are now afraid to be brave? Uh, mm, uh, I really do think that uh, lockdown inhibited creativity. Uh, I think there probably are uh, some brave ideas out there. I mean, at the Capels, we have an award called the Courageous Client Award. Uh, and we gave that uh, this year to uh, a genuinely very, very brave a lady who is the editor-in-chief of a newspaper called Anne Nahar. Uh, this did win a gold at Cannes in print because basically uh, Lebanon is in a state of uh, organized anarchy. There is a government that really should have been re-elected in open and free uh, elections, but hasn't. It's kind of maintained its grip on power. Eventually, they were persuaded that there should be an election. And uh, then the prime minister announced that uh, due to the bomb, uh, the, uh, due to the explosion down in the port, there wasn't enough paper and ink uh, in order for the poll stations to be able to take people's um, votes. So Anne Nahar ceased publication for a day in order to be able to donate all the paper from that day's edition and all the ink from that day's edition in order to create the ballot papers for a free and fair election. This is kind of very, very brave stuff because uh, her father was the editor in chief of Anne Nahar before her and he was blown up um, in a car bomb. So what she's doing in defying the government is extremely courageous. But when I look across most of Cannes and I know what the questioner means, I think, no, I'm still, I'm still, somewhere usually most years in the bronzes and in the um uh the shortlist uh awards i find something that presages the future and as i said i haven't really found anything this year except those two case histories i showed you which i think are really fascinating imbev now creating uh, and entering awards in sustainable business practice and in creative business change itself as a company not through an agency Thank you very much. That's super helpful. Um, we we did have another question, but I think we're running out of time. What do you think, Julian? Can we do one more question? Yeah, I, I think we should we should do what we said and, and yeah. cut it here because people will inevitably drift off. And I'd like to end with a big thank you um, for Patrick, you know, for sharing us the creative person's view, for giving us some ideas maybe of what was missing from can this year whether it's you know we should have less smoke screen clearly there's an opportunity to bring back humor because we all like it and nobody's doing it um and I, yeah you know there's if there's anything any other oh. one single tip patrick you'd give to yes humor. humor i tell you geico last year got a bronze for a funny tv commercial uh this year they weren't back but geico's uh youtube channel has just under 2 million subscribers and they go there to look at funny ads. 
you know, so if you're looking for a purpose, being funny, cheering people up, you know, is as good a purpose as any. And in Geico's case, what it's led to over the last couple of years is to a massive growth in business. Humor is is about selling stuff and selling stuff is about growing your business. I think that's terrific. And I think if anybody doesn't agree with that or would like to talk it more, you've got Patrick's email on the uh, on the screen there. So um, uh, he's a very generous person with opinions and facts and a lot of knowledge. So feel free to use it. Um, feel free to use one of Patrick's courses. If you've got an agency with creative people who would benefit from some of this delivered live to them, I know that Patrick also does uh, webinars and seminars for individual agencies. Do feel free to sign up to any of those. They are absolutely fantastically worthwhile. Great. And thank you, Patrick. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Pippity pip. <laughs> thank you all.